Vice visiting us from UCLA. Uh, Jim and I date back, I don't want to say how long, but a million, million years. Okay. And um, Jim received his undergraduate degree in physics uh, from Hamilton College in upstate New York. And then his uh, medical school training <coughs> at the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, for which he crossed country to the West Coast and um, UCLA and stayed there since with a short interlude, maybe six months in Moscow. I mean, it was part of the fellowship. Right? And then, um, joined the faculty at UCLA as the head of EPE, and he's currently a distinguished professor of both medicine and physiology and director of the cardiovascular research laboratory. He's also the chief of uh, the cardiology division of the um, Department of Medicine. So Jim, I think, is a great example of a physician scientist who does both. He's a physician and a scientist. And to me, what's uh, really remarkable about Jim's career is the very broad range of things that he covered, all the way, you know, we're talking about integration and scales. He covered all scales, from the biophysics of ion channels to the whole heart of the patient. And he has done so with a team of investigators that he was open to accept and encourage in his uh, laboratory and center were coming from many different backgrounds, and uh, including experimentalists at all scales, um, as well as mathematicians and theoreticians who did modeling and looked at the system from the theoretical perspective. So all of that under uh, Jim leadership. So it's really a pleasure and a privilege to have Jim with us today. Can you tell us all about, I can't read this very well, but he'll tell you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yor. It's, uh, it's great to be back here. And we have a long-standing special affinity because of our friendship and also our common, common research interest. And I also have a soft spot in my heart for St. Louis because my father graduated from St. Louis University Medical School in 1935. And so it's, uh, it's a long, almost going to be about uh, eight years or something like that. So anyway, I'm going to talk about kind of a new area for me over the past couple of years, which is really the title here is, uh, I can still read it as new approaches to unravel the genetic base, the genetics of complex diseases, clues from evolutionary biology. This kind of started as a collaboration uh, with a couple of my colleagues at UCLA, Jake Lucis and Evan Wang, and also with one of my collaborators in physics, Alan Karma from Northeastern University. So, in 2001, the results of the Human Genome Project were published. And this is a quote from David Baltimore. Individual humans differ from one another by about one base pair per thousand. These single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs or markers that can allow epidemiologists to uncover the genetic basis of many diseases. They can also provide information about our personal responses to medicines. In this way, the pharmaceutical industry will get new targets and new tools to sharpen drug specificity. Moreover, the analysis of SNPs will provide us with the power to uncover the genetic basis of our individual capabilities, such as mathematical ability, memory, physical coordination, and even perhaps creativity. Pretty stirring words. And this is the euphoria that, you know, this great discovery uh, brought on. So 10 years later or so, uh, you know, we have now something like 1,800 or so different uh, SNPs that have been associated with uh, common diseases. This is kind of one of the last year's map. <clears throat> but some of the 
you know, the, the, some of the thoughts about its significance have sobered a bit, and this is from a review in 2010. Generally, the associations between SNPs and traits tend to be a modest effect size with a median odds ratio per copy of the risk allele of 1.33. So what this is saying is, you know, they're pretty good for identifying increased risk, but the extent of the risk increase is actually quite modest in most cases. And you know, if I just know whether you smoke, whether you have diabetes, whether you have a family history, what your cholesterol, I can predict a tenfold increase in your risk of coronary artery disease. So 30% risk isn't that impressive. So SNPs explain only a small fraction of the genetic component, less than 20%. And it's estimated that hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands of loci affect common polygenic diseases. And many of these loci have individual effect sizes too weak to be identified individually by G1. So how likely are we to discover SNPs convey the high risk of the common human diseases, which is the dream? So I did a little back of the envelope calculation here. Assuming you have about a million SNPs in your population with a greater than 2% prevalence. So the probability of finding a single SNP associated with disease is just already one out of a million. So what if you ask the question, how many ways can you arrange a million things in pairs? Well, now it's 500 billion. And if you go to triplets, it's now 10 to the 18th. And when you get to 16 combinations of 16 SNPs, it's now 10 to the 82nd. Okay, there are only estimated to be 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe. So these are much worse odds than finding a needle in a haystack. So the implications for curing human diseases are monogenic diseases caused by the strong effects of a single gene would be ideally suited for detection by GWAS if they were common, but they are generally rare. In principle, they can be cured by replacing defective gene without understanding the mechanism. However, even in monogenic diseases, we've learned that modifier genes and environmental factors play a key role in determining the severity of the clinical phenotype, for example, in long QT syndromes, as you're all aware. The most common diseases, on the other hand, are polygenic, which means they're caused by modest effects of multiple genes and environmental factors together. GWAS quantifies this risk weakly and can provide important clues about pathways, but it's unlikely to, but it's likely to identify only a minority of the total disease burden for the common diseases since thousands of low can contribute. So how can we move forward from a single gene kind of GWAS perspective to a multi-gene perspective applicable to common polygenic diseases? An approach that we've been exploring we call G-module association study, and that's what I want to describe to you today. But here's the analogy. Imagine you have a business with 20,000 employees, and the business isn't doing so well. And so you're asked to consult on what should, what should what do you recommend to get this business back on track? Why is this business failing? Well, you could use a bottom-up approach. And you could say, I'm going to review the personnel file of this employee, and then I'm going to go through one by one all of the employees, and when I find the culprit, I'm going to find it. Now, occasionally, that is why business fails. This guy, Jerome Carve, lost $7 billion over a short period in January 2000, <laughs> bankrupting the French bank's Societe Generale. So occasionally that approach works. But generally speaking, that's not the right way to go about analyzing why a business is failing. A better approach is a top-down approach. And the idea is, I have a business here. This business has different divisions. I need to look at these different divisions individually see which ones are underperforming, which ones are not communicating with the other ones. That's the way a business consultant would go about this. So can we use that kind of approach for diseases? Because a disease is like a multi-division organization failing, right? So a bottom-up approach is GWAS. Great for monogenic diseases, but it's not great for polygenic diseases as we've seen. Can we develop a top-down approach where we look at genes and how they work in groups, and maybe this can give us more insight? You know, because this is like a business in a way. There's all these divisions that have separate functions, and genes are presumably grouped together to perform these functions. Maybe that's the way we can do this. So the topics I'm going to talk about, how do we analyze genes in terms of 
the way groups of genes work together. How do we analyze it in terms of a modular network? I'm going to tell you about this genetics resource developed by Jake Lucis and his colleagues at UCLA called the Hybrid Mouse Diversity Camp. I'm going to talk about representing groups of genes by what's known as eigengenes. <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about this good enough solutions concept that comes from evolutionary biology and how it might relate to us understanding this question, are common polygenic diseases called by gene mutations or different gene expression patterns? So this is what I call our eigengene team. Jake Lucis is a mouse geneticist, primarily vascular biology. Even Wang is a heart failure signaling person. These are uh, some of our fellows and postdocs. Ellie is our Eskin and Steve Horvath, our biomathematics people in the genetics department. Alan Karma is a physicist at Northeastern, and this is his postdoc. And then our clinical studies are reported by Mario Deng, who is a technician in most of us here. So let me start by looking at this question. This is a wonderful book called How to Control by Kevin Kelly. And it's about you know, how emergent properties occur in complex systems, basically. And he starts the book by asking, what are the differences between things that are made by you engineers, for example, and things that are born. So traditional engineering design, you know, basically kind of uses the linear logic. Now you have feedback, and Igor always argues with me on this, but the point is, is that you want to get from A to B. That's your purpose as an engineer, right? And if you want a highly efficient machine that does that, you're really only designing it to do this one thing. And that, unfortunately, makes it vulnerable. So it's highly efficient. But it's not really that intrinsically adaptable because you only designed it to do one thing. And it's somewhat vulnerable because if you cut any link in this chain, you can no longer get from the So Kevin Kelly argues that nature couldn't, biological design possibly couldn't use that, that strategy. And that it really is a network launch. And you need to be able to have a system where a lot of things are interconnected by parallel pathways. And this may be inefficient because it's redundant, but it's also adaptable because it's a bug. You can get to a lot of different places. <clears throat> and it's also robust because you cut any one of these pathways, there's an alternative pathway. Now, one of the interesting things is that these nonlinear networks that are characterized by feedback or feed forward have emergent properties, non intuitive properties that make the whole greater than the sum of the parts, which is not true for linear systems. And the interesting thing is they're actually not inefficient. They actually become very efficient because of something called small world properties. That are very so here's the concept of analyzing a complex system using network theory or graph theory. It was invented by Leonard Euler in 1736. He did it to solve this cocktail party puzzle. And the question was the paradox of the Konigsberg bridges. This is the layout of Konigsberg with before 1875 with the Nipoff Island and these land areas uh, in between the Fregel River, solving the Konigsberg problem and finding a route around the city that would require a person to cross each bridge only once. In 1736, Euler gave birth to graph theory by replacing each of the four land areas with nodes, A to D, and each bridge with a link, small a to G, obtaining a graph with four nodes and seven links. He then proved that on the Konigsberg graph, a route crossing each link only once does not exist. So in other words, if you have two nodes, you'd need one bridge to get there and one to get back. So you have to have, if you have an even number of nodes, you need an even number of links to get back to the same point. Or an odd number, you need an odd number, but this is even an odd. So this was a curiosity, but in the, and it was developed theoretically in 1800s. But in the 1900s, it, the social scientists got very interested in this. And, you know, it then later became applied, in the late 1900s, became applied to biological networks. And the basic idea is this like you take a metabolic pathway like this, going from UMP to CTP. And the idea is if you want to ab, you know, represent this kind of in a very pared down abstract way, you know, you can just essentially represent each of the metabolites as a node 
And each of the enzymes that converts one to the other is a link. Right? So in metabolites, the, the metabolome, you, the metabolites are the nodes, the enzymes are the link. In the genome, if you're looking at gene co-expression, you know, what, how genes influence others co-expression, the genes are the nodes, and the transcription factors, let's say, turn on one or turn on multiple ones are the links. In the proteome, proteins are the nodes, and protein-protein binding interactions are the links. So you can think of, this is kind of a 10,000 foot view of a complex system. And so here, for example, is E. coli. And what you see here are the different metabolic pathways, you know, lipid metabolism, glycolysis, oxidative phosphorylation, et cetera. And you can represent them in a typical engineering flow diagram like this. You know, here you see the links that connect the different groups. So this is kind of modular representation. And notice that some of these nodes here, you know, are connected to vast numbers of other genes that are called hub nodes. This is what's called the topological overlay map, where the different colors represent the clusters. So there are different ways of representing them. And it turns out that what's very interesting is that when you represent these networks like this way, they're kind of intuitive as to the properties that they develop. So imagine you have just a certain number of nodes and a certain number of links, and you were to just randomly distribute the links among those nodes, right? then you would have an, uh, essentially a, a Gaussian distribution. Some nodes, on average, would have a certain number of links, and there'd be some that had a few more and some that had a few less. Right? But basically, they would fall in some kind of random distribution like that. But now imagine that this, this network is growing, and so you're throwing in new nodes and throwing in new links over time. Then the nodes that have been there the longest, every time new links come in, have a higher probability of gaining another link. So you're going to then see an exponential relationship between the average, the number of links uh, per node, where you fall up this way. So most of the nodes will have the average number, but you'll have some that are much more highly connected than the others. Okay? Now add one more feature called preferential attachment, which means if you're a node that has a lot of links already, when new links come into the system, they want to attach to you. So you have an advantage in capturing the new nodes. Okay? And that's called preferential attachment. It can occur kind of in an unorganized structure or in a modular structure. And it turns out, in this case, you get a power law. The number, average number of nodes per link follows a power law distribution. Why is that important? Here is, on a linear scale, the difference between an exponential distribution and a power law distribution. The power law has this fat tail, what it's called, which means that you will have a small number of nodes that are extremely highly connected. Right? So the average might be five links here. By the time you get to how many nodes have 20 links, there's virtually none. But in the power law distribution, that's not true. You have a fair number that sustains itself. So this is a scale-free distribution or power law distribution. And it turns out that networks that form links randomly grow and evolve under selective pressures such as social interaction and technology worlds tend towards a scale-free topology. This has been shown for social networks. This is Kevin Bacon and the six degrees of separation. Why internet topology, airplane routes, spread of epidemics. And it turns out these criteria are exactly what happens in biology during evolution, where you have natural selection. And when Laszlo Barabasi first decided to apply this to biological systems, he actually found, when he analyzed metabolite networks, gene co-expression, and protein-protein interactions, they all tended to have this scale-free topology. What are the advantages of scale-free topology? This is where the small world effects comes in. And it's related to these highly connected nodes, these hub nodes. Here's what I mean. These highly connected hub nodes make the distance between any two nodes short. This is the six degrees of separation, separation effect. So if every node is connected to a hub node, and all hub nodes are connected to each other, then any two nodes can be connected by no more than three links. Right? You go from 
your hub node in your module to the hub node in the other module and to the individual in there. This high connectivity, thus an efficient alternate route to make a connection between nodes is always present, which makes the network very adaptable to changing environmental conditions. And this kind of recaptures the efficiency that you thought you lost because of all these parallel connections. This high connectivity also confers robustness to the network. And typically, in a scale-free network, you have to destroy up to 80% of the links if you just randomly destroy them before the network undergoes a catastrophic failure. But for example, if my website crashes, the internet does just fine. But I'm one of millions of nodes. If one of the nodes you, you, you attack is the Google node, everybody suffers. So a targeted attack on hub nodes can disable the network quick, quickly, converting therapeutic to vulnerability. So here it kind of satisfies these properties, these biological engineering properties. The network is inherently adaptable, it's robust, and it develops this small world effect. Here's what I mean by that. Here's E. coli metabolism. We know every single metabolism. There's 778 of them. What if they were arranged linearly? with you know, 777 links between them. So I'm an E. coli, and I'm happily munching away on substrate 774, but now someone changes the broth, and suddenly I have now only substrate Y here, number five. I've got hundreds of steps in order to synthesize urine, urine which I need to make DNA, which I need to replicate. This is going to be inefficient and energetically prohibitive. But if I have a few hub nodes that let me leapfrog those distances, I am just fine. I get there in just a few more steps. And in fact, when you look at the, and you know, we know all the links. The links are the enzymes converting the substrates. And E. coli, the average distance between any two nodes is only 3.2 <coughs> links. So you can put that bacteria in pretty much any of its metabolites and will be able to synthesize what it needs to proliferate. And there's, you know, that's because there's 5,763 different links. Okay, so that's a little bit about networks. How do we apply this to a gene network? Well, this is this resource that Jake and his colleagues have developed. It consists of a hun over 100 common inbred and recombinant inbred strains which have been either entirely sequenced or densely genotyped. These strains are all commercially available and thus can be assayed for multiple phenotypes by different laboratories providing cumulative biological insights. The GWAS strategy using this approach has been successfully detected in finding out genes modulating adiposity, bone density, plasma lipids, and other complex traits. How do we use this? So what we've done is to take tissue, in this case the heart, from all of these hundred strains and basically take microarrays and look at the gene expression pattern we see. And then we can use the network uh, analysis kind of programs. One, the one we used that was developed at UCLA originally is called Weighted Gene Co-Expression Network Analysis, or WGCNA. And we've developed a new one that's based on maximum information called MICA here. So the idea is you obtain the microarrays, let's say, for these genes, of all strains, for the genes that express at a significant level of the tissue, which is about 8,000 in the heart, you just use linear regression or mutual information to calculate the correlation coefficient, or in the latter case, maximal information content, quantifying how strongly one gene's expression level correlates with every other gene's expression level across all 100 strains. So you generate an 8,000 by 8,000 gene expression, or what's called an adjacency matrix. And then you can apply a tree cutting algorithm or other techniques to group these genes, these 8,000 genes, into modules that you know always move together with each other above a certain threshold. So typically, you'll get about 20 modules, each of which contains tens to hundreds of genes. And then you can look at assign likely functions to these gene modules by identifying the known genes which are enriched in a given you might see in modules that are rich in metabolism genes or apoptosis genes. So you can get a clue, even though the construct construct is unbiased in that sense, as to what they actually do. 
So here, for example, is the topological overlay network where each color kind of represents a different module in these mice parts. And here's another way of expressing it called the heat map. And so in the heat map here, you know, we put each strain is one of the lines, one of the columns here. And if the gene is expressed at a high level, it's in red, and if at a low level, it's in green, and black is kind of in between. They've already kind of prearranged them into the modules. And the striking thing here is, you know, you see this strain has a totally different gene expression pattern as the next, as the next, as the next, as the next. What's fascinating about this is each strain, the variation is only about 10% of the variation between strains. So it seems like each of these genetically identical mouse strains, even though they're totally normal mice, express their genes in a very different way from another strain. The eigen gene is kind of a way of representing the aggregate behavior of these modules, which is computed by principal component analysis of these correlation coefficients. So for example, here we take a bunch of the different modules. Here we take 20 different strains. You can kind of see how each one varies. And for each module now, we essentially use PCA to calculate kind of an, an average expression level for that group of genes in that strain and condense that into the item genes here. So you, you can see even more clearly here is that the module levels, the expression levels of these different modules vary dramatically from strain to strain, even though within a strain, they're very similar. So an eigengene is not a physical entity like a real gene. It's a phenomenological representation of the aggregate behavior of a group of real genes. So an analogy I would draw, it's like the refractory period, right? The refractory period is some combination of multiple ionic conductances. Right? But these are the real entities, the proteins. This is kind of a phenomenological representation of their aggregate behavior. So if you do that, here's the 20 modules, here's the 102 different strains, and you see how different each strain expresses these genes. What's next fascinating is you take these strains of mice and you expose them to an environmental stressor. So in this case, since we're interested in heart failure, we put an isoterminal infusion pump in them for three weeks. And we watched what happens. And what is striking is that different strains respond very differently. Some have no change in heart rate. Some have massive hypertrophy. Some have no mortality. Some have 100% mortality. Some the EF increases and, and stays increased. Others it deteriorates. Looking at mitochondrial DNA, we see that some have a robust biogenesis response, and others actually lose mitochondria. <coughs> What you can kind of see here from the red stripes is these are those strains that have the biggest decrease in, in mitochondrial DNA. And they seem to be collected among the, you know, at the right ends here, the ones that have the higher mortality, the higher increases in heart rate, and the decrease in the And you can look at how these gene expression patterns, these eigen gene expression patterns, change before and after isoterminal. So you see that there are reactive responses to the stimulus of the isoterminal. Then what you can do is to say, well, what is the correlation between a given expression level of a different module and the phenotypic characteristics in all those strains of mice? So we look at heart rate, LD weight, left field so all of these things. So all of these mice were echoed before and after. Uh, and then look at those. And you see that some of these modules, like module 5 here, has a very high correlation. If this module is expressed at a low level, basically you get all of the phenotypic, a high you know, susceptibility to the heart failure traits. And there are others, you know, like number 11 here, that have a weaker but a positive correlation. This one is also a negative correlation. And so we can see then how a group of genes, the expression level of a group of genes, correlates with susceptibility to hypertrophy and heart failure. And this module five consists of 41 genes, for example. 
And this is what most of the genes do. What, you know, if you go to, geo, to a gene ontology analysis, you can kind of get a sense for what they do. So you, this is the GWAS analysis from the same thing. And we see that we did see uh, significant correlations with some of the SNPs with different traits shown here. But the interesting thing with traditional GWAS, we identified about 19 different loci or SNPs that were usually associated with just a single trait, like RV or liver lung weights or sudden death, but not multiple traits. And these loci did actually show significant overlap with GWAS loci that were suggested, have been suggestively associated with heart failure in humans. GWAS identified four gene modules that were associated broadly with multiple heart failure. And this module five with 41 genes shows the strongest correlation. And we are now looking at those individual genes to see if we can, you know, use that as a way to develop target pathways that might be involved in this response. So the implications are that GWAS loci representing single gene effects correlate with single traits, but these GMOS modules representing the integrated effects of many genes correlate broadly with multiple heart failure traits. So this greatly improves our odds. Right? With GWAS, with 20,000 genes or a million strips, we're looking for one in a million, and by the time you get to 16, we're looking for one atom in the universe. But with GMOS, you reduce the data dramatically from 8,000 you know, genes expressed in the heart to these 20 gene modules. So you're looking for one out of 20 correlation, and even if you look at 16, you know, the numbers are still reasonable. So we think this is statistically a much more powerful way or much more uh, feasible way to try to look at multiple gene association. So these HMDP strains exhibit markedly different eigengene expression patterns, even though individuals within a strain exhibit very similar pattern. Different eigengene expression patterns are associated with differential susceptibility to environmental stressors and can identify candidate genes. But why? You know, why does an evolution just converge towards the ideal mouse that expresses their genes in a certain way? Here you've got 100 different strains with totally different gene expression patterns. Why is that? And they're all perfectly happy and healthy mice. So here's where this converges with the, what Al and Carmen and I were interested in, which is uh, basically, how does a cell know how many ion channels of any kind to express to get a normal action potential was the original question. But you know, here's this paradox that has existed in evolutionary biology, is that these scale-free modular networks underlying living systems are very robust. We've already said you had to destroy 80% of the nodes for catastrophic. Yeah. And that's what you need. If you're an organism in which the environment is constantly changing, you need to maintain some kind of stability and homeostasis, right? However, this would seem to be at odds with the ability to adapt and evolve, since robustness implies persistence of phenotype, which may inhibit the capacity for evolutionary change. So this question is, how can adaptability be compatible with robustness? It's kind of a question that has fascinated evolutionary biologists. And here's where we come to this idea of good enough solutions. And basically, the you know, pioneer in, in applying this evolutionary biology, we'll get to in a minute, was Eve Martin. But the idea is that in complex systems with many parameters, many solutions are typically good enough to produce the same phenotype. You know, if you are curve fitting to data and you have a lot of adjustable parameters, there are many combinations that will give just as good a fit. Right? You have local minima, you just find which one it is. And they can be very different from each other. And to survive, if you think about it, living organisms don't need perfect solutions, they only need good enough solutions. You know, you, if you need dinner, you don't matter whether you get your arrow into the right or the left ventricle of the deer you're shooting or whatever, right? So, and this is the point that Eve Martyr, who's at Brandeis, as I mentioned, uh, really put together when she was studying lobsters and crabs. And they have this somatogastric ganglion of about 30 neurons that has this bursting pattern. 
and basically controls the digestive activity, the peristalsis of the gut, right? <clears throat> so it produces these rhythmic motor patterns, even after removed from the air. It has about 30 large neurons with established connectivity, and it's easy to record from. So she looked at these different lobsters in this case, and they both had very similar bursting patterns. But when she voltage clamped the neurons, she found that this guy used a totally different combination of ion channels to produce this first pattern compared to this guy. And when she looked at PCR measurements, she found you know the expression levels were also very variable from from, uh, from lobster to lobster. So she thought this was very curious. So she made a model of this bursting model, uh, and with 17 adjustable parameters corresponding to different ionic currents, right? And she just randomly simulated perturbations in the levels 600,000 times. She studied the behavior of each of these models under a variety of conditions. And then she found which of the 600,000 basically matched the performance of the biological neurons. And out of that 600,000, she came up with about 1,300 solutions. Here's some examples, you know, bursting patterns are roughly similar, and here's the different values of the parameters showing how different they are from, you know, very different, not. And the real insight she had was, say, was the idea of this, in this slide, that multiple good enough solutions in a population ensures a substrate for evolution under diverse environmental conditions. So the idea here is that individuals are robust to many, but not all, environmental stimuli. Different individuals with different good enough solutions are differentially susceptible to environmental stressors. Thus, as long as some individuals are resistant to the stressor, the population will survive, enhancing both the adaptability and robustness of the population. So imagine you have these two lobsters, and one is chosen to use calcium activated potassium channels as an essential component of its bursting activity. But another lobster said, I'm not going to use that, and I chose a different one. So now someone dumps the toxin that blocks calcium activated potassium channels into the bay. Right? The first guy is going to die. But the other guy is going to be fine, and is going to be able to survive and repopulate the bay. So the idea is that our robustness operates at the individual level but the adaptability operates at the population. <clears throat> so these are lobsters and crabs. How could this be is relevant to human physiology? Well, this is a nice study by, from Eric Sobey's group where he was asking this kind of question about how do we know that the, when we make a model of the cardiac act potential, what conductances to choose? Because there are a lot of ionic currents. And what he explored was which, that, you know, basically different, completely different combinations of ionic conductances could produce the identical action. And so here's an example where he's chosen one example. This happens, parameter happens to be IKR. And notice that, I can't see the colors now, but this is blue, I think. In, the, in this one here, this act potential, the blue act potential, has a strong dependence on IKR. This one has a weak dependence on IKR. Right? So imagine now you gave two people who chose these different solutions, sodalol or clinical, right? The blue guy, who has a large IK on it, when you block that, it's going to have trouble repolarizing, you're going to get QT prolongation, and it's going to be at a high risk of torsade form. But this guy, who chose to repolarize, doesn't <coughs> use much IKR to repolarize his action potential, is going to be just fine. So this may be a great explanation for why side effects of drugs are so variable from person to person. So exploring this idea, Alan, with his postdocs, went on to look at EC coupling in the mice and took this mouse model of the cardiac action potential and calcium transient and basically uh, picked 100,000 random sets of conductances, and he just looked at five EC coupling uh, parameters, the calcium current, ITO, sodium calcium exchanger, circuit pump, and 
And he evolved these conductances using a minimization algorithm. He told the average cytosolic calcium and calcium transient amplitude were within 1% of normal values of the control set of conductances during constant pacing at 400 milliseconds. He rejected undesirable solutions such as aperiodic behavior, alternates, et cetera. And out of these 100,000, actually 65,000 of them gave good enough solutions. And so here's an example of two of five different solutions. You can see the different colors represent the five different parameters. And you can see there's quite a dramatic difference, you know, a five or fold range in the conductance between here and here, for example, and the last parameter here, and between the red here and here, you see. And they produce virtually identical calcium transients. And interestingly, even though he wasn't fitting the ash potential, the ash potentials were almost uh, identical too. So we then looked at the data from these HMTP strains, and we took a number of genes that uh, you know, are all involved in EC coupling, shown here. And we just looked at what was the range of expression level. And it, you know, it matches pretty well. It's about a five-fold or so difference between the different strains at the level of expression. And so here is kind of plot of the distribution of ITO in the models versus in the gene expression levels of ITO in the, um, in the uh, microarray data, rounded in receptors. And they, they match up pretty well, surprisingly well. You see, these are much more tightly uh, regulated than some of the other parameters. If you actually look at IKR and IKS, you know, here's the range from about 0.5 to 1.5 for IKR, and from about you know 0.6 to 1.4 or something. So you know, mice don't get for a side because they don't depend much on IKR or IKS for repolarization. But you know, would these be the high risk guys that have a high IKR and a low IKS? or Torsad and these other guys be the low risk guy. So it's intriguing to think of it. So <clears throat> the idea that we've been pursuing that I call this gene module association study is the idea is to kind of take our gene expression profiles from these mice. We have 100 strains. We can kind of condense the 20,000 genes into a network of 20 eigengenes. We can then expose that the panel of mice to an external stressor. We can look at the phenotypic spectrum. And, you know, basically, we can see which ones are associated with compensation and which with decompensation. And the idea is that these different gene expression patterns correspond to different good enough solutions. And they define the successful adaptation in terms of poor adaptation. We can actually use the same techniques in human samples, so we can take genes from human hearts. We, we think we need about 20, uh, only 20 samples actually to construct a gene network. And we can see whether, you know, certain, well, first of all, whether the network patterns are similar and whether there's any correlation between the mouse and the other data. So that's the concept. The initial hypothesis that we're testing is that heart failure susceptibility is created by a mismatch between the eigengenes controlling energy consumption, such as the calcium cycle models, and the eigengenes regulating energy production, the metabolic models. So basically, the heart can't produce the energy it needs in some of these strains when it's exposed to this. So the implications of this is that except for identical twins, each human being is genetically different from every other human being, equivalent to a different HMDP strain. It is generally assumed that diseases and drug interactions are caused by mutations in the coding regions of genes. But if different eigengene patterns reflect different good enough solutions designed to ensure that a population survives by enhancing diversity among its individuals, this raises the possibility that the way groups of normal wild type genes are expressed as reflected by the eigengene patterns may be as or even more important than mutations. You know, you take the 26 letters of the alphabet, you arrange them one way, you get more in peace. You arrange them another way, you get the instruction manual for your washing machine. You don't have to mutate the letters to get a very different phenotype. Same genes, different phenotype. Your liver and your heart, those are the identical genes, but they have completely different phenotypes depending on which of those genes you choose to express. So this HMDP, because of its 
high resolution. In fact, that you know each mouse is identically identical, genetically identical, so you can repeat the experiment as many times and as many time points as you want. Represents a powerful new systems genetics resource to test this paradigm. And in principle, it's applicable to any disease that can be induced by an environmental stressor to which these strains show differential susceptibility. How could we conceive of using this if these specific eigengene patterns can be linked to susceptibility to a disease? And can eigengene expression patterns be altered therapeutically to reduce susceptibility to disease? <clears throat> you know, we don't know the answer to these questions. <clears throat> we don't know what controls the level of expression of the different modules. You know, are they hub genes, cis-regulated genes? Are they transcription factors or microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs? You know, that often regulate hundreds of genes. What's the role of chromatin remodeling, exposing the genes, allowing them to be expressed, the role of DNA methylation? These are all questions that we that need to be explored. But the idea is that this doesn't need to be just a UCLA uh, project. You know, this is the beauty of this is any disease that can be mimicked by this, we can include from multiple institutions into an HMDP database. We can combine it with all both the discovery-driven, the other omics techniques, as well as hypothesis-driven ones, and perhaps then get a much clearer idea of how these gene-gene interactions are working to influence susceptibility to these common diseases. And hopefully, you'd be able to relate them to human diseases from the human tissue. So that's our dream. We would encourage people to, who are interested in this to, to uh, contribute data from their, you know, uh, from their institution and from their studies to do this and make it available to the world as a com uh, combined resource and integrate all the other species for which we have different you know, uh, advantages for studying the genetics of these diseases as well. So I have a few um, almost non-final remarks. First, I have a disclaimer. <laughs> I do not hate reductionists. All, all of my best friends are reductionists. <clears throat> but I am an active member of Reductionist Anonymous. <coughs> Every day I say to myself, hi, my name is Jim, and I am a reductionist. I have been soberly integrated for more than 20 years. <laughs> three-step program, reductionism is essential, and knowledge for knowledge's sake is a worthwhile ultimate goal of fundamental science. However, reductionism is only half of the equation. To translate fundamental science to medicine requires understanding of complex systems in which the whole is fundamentally greater than the sum of the parts. Integrative approaches are the second half of this equation. The tools to study the whole are becoming increasingly available. So I also have some advice to young scientists who might be considering embarking along this path. You mean give some to old scientists too? <laughs> <laughs> Everything for young scientists also applies to this <laughs> As you'll see from the final part of this slide. Don't be a one-dimensional scientist. Think vertically between the levels as well as horizontally within the levels. Don't be discouraged by one-dimensional peer review. <laughs> Careers may be built on single molecules and single signaling pathways, but nature is built on networks. And remember the words of Max Planck. A new scientific theory does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation <laughs> grows up. <laughs> so that's the advice of the old scientists. <laughs> And again, this is really a privilege for me to present this really fun collaboration between a, a whole group of people. And uh, I think uh, I've learned so much. I knew nothing about genetics at all. I'm slowly uh, learning a little bit about it. And we're collaborating with uh, Tom Capilla and Ken Margulies of Ken with the Human Studies, as well as you and Ashley at the Human Studies, to try to translate this to, uh, to human heart failure. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim, for a fascinating talk and for giving us uh, good enough uh, food for thought. And so, uh, whoever.
whoever has questions or comments, please. Igor. Yeah. First of all, comment. Uh, a, a war and peace cannot be written in, in, in an alphabet with 26 characters. <laughs> it was written in an alphabet with 33 characters. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it could be translated. <laughs> So, but actually it's a relevant comment because basically what you described, if I got at least 1% of it, is that you're essentially at the stage what uh, electrostatics was at, but then you have to write electrodynamics. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so essentially you, solutions you, which you can arrive at with different distribution of gene expression are not stationary obviously, and, and they respond to so many different biological rhythms and some normal, some pathological, including you know, circadian variability, for example, during which you have oscillations of gene expression it would be you know, several fold over the course of 12, 12 uh, hours. So the question I have essentially is, do, do we have the math to, to make this transition from electrostatics to electrodynamics or, or eigen-gene statics to eigen-gene dynamics? Right. And what no, is this math? That's, a, that's an excellent, and that's the key question. Yes, you know. We these uh, techniques for analyzing and picking and detecting the structure of, of networks have assumptions to them, and we don't know the best way to do it. Okay. So, you know, we can use. I described two methods, but there are many. There are others too. Do you want to use linear, look for just linear expressions, or as well as nonlinear expression between genes? And then there are always some arbitrary assumptions that you make. You know. Um, you could look at the level of 100 modules, or you could look at the level of 20 modules, in the sense that, you know, think of it in terms of like a business, right? If you were to look at a business, you could look at it at the level of a division, a, a business will have divisions, and then those divisions have subdivisions, and those subdivisions have sections, and those sections have subsections. So do you look at the level of the major divisions, which might be, you know, 10 or 12, or subdivisions, which may be, 25 or 30, or sections, you know, which may be 50 or 100. So, you know, we don't know the best way to look at this. And the only way we can do it is kind of do the analysis and then look at how it actually, how powerful is the correlation between the response that we see and the manifestations of the disease. And then ultimately, to validate that, we have to find a way to be able to change the IMG pattern and show that it actually changes the susceptibility to the disease. So right now, this is more at the stage of philosophy than it is in data-driven. This is really just a start, but you know, we, we think it's a, a worthwhile approach. So, so Jim, just sort of keeping in the philosophical range, um, this may be a little bit out there. So is all disease phenotype really sort of nature's good enough solution to some environmental stressor. I mean, for example, in heart failure, the only thing I know a little bit about, I mean, we, we have a dilated cardiomyopathic phenotype. You can get there from a specific gene mutation or a large LED infarct. At the end of the day, it's dilated and squabular. It doesn't work well. Heart failure with a preserved DF, which we have no clue what it is, really, but it always usually manifests with sort of some concentric small mm -hmm. chamber that doesn't so well, those are all sort of good enough solutions for multiple etiologies. So, is so are disease phenotypes really adaptive, good enough adaptive solutions to some external stressor? Well, I think that, I mean, that's the hypothesis that we're testing is right. the idea that the that basically there are a lot of different combinations of gene expression patterns that are good enough to get you through your normal daily existence. Right. But that some of you are going to not, you know, if you create a large environmental perturbation like an infarct, right. some people, the same infarct, are going to develop severe heart failure, and other people are going to stabilize. You know, so some people are going to remodel differently than others, and there's a in, there's a variation between individuals. And the question is, can that be explained by? You know these different good enough solutions. I mean, the most to me, the most intuitive example, which is why I gave it, was the idea: why do some people get torsade de Juan when they take an IKR blocker and other people don't? 
Or why do some people who have the same genetic defect compensate and not get the arrhythmias on other people? I think it's because what we used to call modified genes, you know, which is kind of a vague term, is actually the different gene expression patterns of these models. I mean, that's one possibility. Getting at what's controlling these large gene expression patterns, have you thought about testing the response to other stimuli, not a heart failure, for example, or in other organs to see whether they yeah. still travel together? Because if you think that they're regulated by, you know, these, you know, master regulators, they should travel together in all tissues. Well, I don't know. I think, you know, they can't travel. They're, they are tissue specific because otherwise, your liver and your heart would be do the same thing. So they're they're very tissue specific. And the question, you know, during development, for example, the DNA methylation pattern determines whether something becomes a liver or becomes a heart, right? So I mean there there are a lot of possible epigenetic factors that end up directing the cells down one pathway or another. Sure, so, but maybe like one subset of them, you know, would travel together. Yeah. You know, you would maybe see the similar cluster. Yeah. Or even in the heart, just in response to different stimuli, yeah. not heart failure. So what we're doing, the next step we're doing for started experiments is, is to look at angiotensin in the heart failure. And then we're going to pick a subset of strains and expose them to angiotensin overdose to develop heart failure and see whether the same strains are like susceptible or different. And we're going to do a subset of TAC also. So we can see is the response to isoterminal unique to isoterminal, or is it really a common response that produces susceptibility to multiple different kind of insults that just answer the heart? So we don't know the answer to that. So they're good questions. In turning your set of eigenogenes, it's going to be complicated by um, tissues, for example, that can increase the expression of a gene by 10,000 fold but not increase its current <coughs> nutrition or the metabolism of the substrates. Can you tell me your thoughts about how you're going to get around that? Yeah, I think that's a great question, you know, because we we have gene expressions, but then we have all these post-translational mechanisms that change the functional So, And we don't know how the correlation is yet. We, for example, in this case, we're, we're going to take those some of the key EC coupling genes, like the L type calcium, mm -hmm. and we're going to look at the DNA expression and then isolate the cells from those strains and measure the calcium current density and see if there's a correlation. So we can do that with you know maybe five or six different proteins, but it's it's a lot of work and it's you know uh, you can't really do it for the whole. So each of the eigen gene sets are going to have to be co-correlated with the different omics technologies. Different right? Well, the idea is to, you know, if I think the idea is to get this, put this data together. So you'll have genomic data, you'll have proteomic data, you'll have metabolomic data, and then you can explore how they correlate with each other. You know, and the question is, is it just, is this just, we know that there's an association between this pattern and this outcome. And, but we don't know whether it's, you know, that that pattern really reflects what we think it should in terms of protein expression levels. But it's still a marker that predicts what the outcome is either way, even though the connections between them may be much more complicated. So this is all really just exploratory at this point, and there are many possibilities. But it's a start. It's a place to start. Yeah. A few genetics questions. So, with 121 strains, have you tried um, mapping polymorphisms or associating polymorphisms with the expression level of non gene? Right, because that, that yeah. And there are um, there are a number of SNPs that correlate with the expression with the eigen gene level, so we can do that. And so you should be able to cross mice and then get, say, progeny that have intermediate expression levels or some variation. Yeah, you could do crosses that way and try to get at mapping them in the regions. But the other thing that 
the BMW. The other thing you talk about, so this is. You know, it's a lot of work to go to <laughs> the type. You know how many echoes? This represents thousands of echoes on my so. I guess my second, so second question, you talk about like developing a community to work on these 121 strings, but practically you cannot ship 121 strings or do very complex experiments, right? So that go I understand. Well, yeah, but you know, you don't need to, I don't need to ship them to you, right? You order them from, uh, from Bar Harbor. These strains are all commercially available. You can just order them and do the experiments yourself. They're you not, to do. they're not like, you know, uh, genetically modified. Well, I, I wonder basically, um, so practically I cannot afford to buy 121 strains and maintain them. But can you define a subset of strings? Neither can I. Neither can we. Uh, <laughs> to say like, no, I mean, I, I think that's why it makes sense for this to be a collective enterprise that people are interested in. You know, you know, and you don't necessarily, you know, we, you don't necessarily need to do all hundred strings. I mean, you can, you can construct the gene network from about probably 20 strains. So you could do 20 strings. And the, the key is to show that you have a differential susceptibility to the environmental stressor. And you know, if you see that there is a correlation, then you can always add more strains to strengthen the data and see how the association holds up. So. Yeah. So what are different sets uh, create the same phenotype? It depends how you find the phenotype. For example, I'll be very specific in terms of the data that you showed from here. You saw the ADLA and showing that you can change different electronic expressions so on to get the same action. But the definition of the same is very yeah. broad, and it's a question, what do you mean by the same? If it's, right. you just match an action potential yeah. for the same concentration, for the same rate, and so on, I really can find many, many different right. combinations. But I'll give you an example. You talked about the large IKR and small IKR. IKR is sensitive to external potassium concentration. And so if you change the external potassium concentration, in one person or in one entity, the action for them will change by a lot, and the other one it will not. So then they are not the same as in situ. The question is, what are the set of tests that define the same phenotype? Kind of the general principle is that if you have the same number of adjustable input parameters as the number of output and constraints, you basically only have one solution. If you have the more excess of in adjustable input parameters you have over output, the more good enough solutions you the more combinations of those parameters will produce alternate solutions that are just as good enough fit. And so you're right, I mean we've just chosen one cycle length, you know, we haven't considered the fact, that, well what if we pace the heart at 200 milliseconds or a thousand milliseconds, which one of those solutions would drop out? And, or if you wanted to look at for good enough solution for survival. Mm -hmm. Rate dependent adaptation, restitution, and then, sure. you know, concentration but, dependence have to be pretty. But I only, we only, we only perturbed five parameters, right? And we found 65,000 solutions out of 100,000 trucks, 65% rate. So I can add a lot more constraints on there before I get down to, you know, and so that I think that's. That's the issue. It's, it's you take a high dimensional model to fit data. You know, you can get many combinations of parameters, and that's one of the reasons biologists sometimes, in my experience, don't trust modeling because they think, well, a model can show anything you want it to show, which it can if it has enough parameters. So, you know, yeah. Have you thought about taking um, a genetically modified <coughs> mouse that has a hard player phenotype? and putting it on different backgrounds that you show and seeing whether you can pull out these eigen networks that you have. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, you know, I we thought of it from a slightly different aspect, which is, my guess is, you know, when you, a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna make, knock out this gene or I'm gonna overexpress this gene, right? I wonder how 
the phenotype, how dependent the phenotype you see when you do that is dependent on which strain you use. Because of course, most of the time, people don't get what they expect when they do that. Or you and my them. guess is you'll see a big difference whether you use, you know, C57 black versus some other strain. And, and, you know, I think that needs to be looked at. But there are well-known examples of like deaf and not deaf and different backgrounds, for example, that like each deaf knockout mice yeah. that develop heart failure and die versus no phenotype on different strains. Yeah. So that might be a good starting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you could do that. I mean, that's why, you know, that's basically the question of this patient with Brugada syndrome dies and his brother who, you know, is not has this exact mutation, but the different genetic background never has a thing. So, so there's a way to get it. Then, what know? about gender? Not not to make your echo but those yeah. go up, but, but now you've got sort of yeah. 121 different mice. Hopefully, they're boy and girl mice. But but how, how does gender affect it? Do, do do the males and females track within a dry strain in terms of? So we haven't looked at any injury yeah. response. Yeah, we haven't looked at. Um, that in the heart, but Jake has looked in the liver at differences between male and females, and they show different expression patterns within the same strain. So, you know, this is not, this is partly being regulated by epigenetic factors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. See, um, would you look at the peripheral blood lymphocytes for both mice and for humans? Uh, you get up around two or three percent uh, with translocations, uh, and that's uh, close to the end of life for both humans and for mice. Uh, and what I'm wondering here is uh, if the real problem is, and I think that uh, with the heart, you know, it's like a parts problem because you get a thousand million billion beats with the mouse and a billion beats with the human and an elephant. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be a parts problem at the cellular level or some lower level. Uh, now, if the problem is like with the peripheral blood lymphocytes, if you get two or three of them uh, with translocations, then uh, it, there's a problem with the other 97%. Uh, now, with the, this type of analysis, you mean in the same strain? 97%, right? You mean in the same strain? Or you're, you're saying in the same strain, are they really genetically identical or not? Well, in, in all the strains you look at, yeah. uh, you're looking at a, a large number of cells. Yeah. So how can you see a difference of two or three percent of the cells? If two or three percent of the cells are defective, and that's what's causing the problem, uh, how could you see that? Well, we're just looking at a global. We're taking a whole heart tissue that has myocytes, fibroblasts, you know, all the other non-myocytes as well, and we're looking at the gene expression levels. And some of these modules actually probably correspond to different cell types. So they could be different cell types as well as, you know, differences, actual models within the same cell type. But, uh, you know, I think that's where we stand so far, so. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you again.